We live? I think we're live. Hopefully you guys can hear me. I never know if this mic is working. There we go. What's up? It's Subin Demania, AKA Dr. Z Dog, whatever the hell, dude. Why? You know what? I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I made up this thing Z Dog MD because in the 90s, my homies used to call me Z Dog because I used to like the gangster rap like any other off white suburban kid. And then when I was coming up with social media handles, I just like, oh, Z Dog MD, because you know, the MD, and now I'm stuck with it. And it's dumb and I hate it, but it's me. What can you do? It's just like everything. Sometimes you love yourself, sometimes you hate yourself. What up, Josette? Crossing platforms you. Ari Land, what up? Dale Blake is here, good morning. Marissa K says frozen, I hope I'm not frozen. Cause then I'd have to be like, you know, let it go, let it go. Did you guys see my parody about let it flow about prostate disease? Probably not. Kimberly McLaren, hey, hey, Z. Okay, today I wanna talk, I'm in my kitchen. I'm alone, the kids are at school. My wife went back to work. Victoria, my new um, assistant slash partner in crime is not here yet. So I thought I'd catch up with you guys because I've been having a hard time, I'm not gonna lie. I'm out of my mind, I'm insane. Uh, having moved from Las Vegas back to the Bay Area to be closer to friends and connections and we had this house here and all this other stuff. The whole idea was that I'd be less isolated than I was in Las Vegas. But the problem is, like Tom didn't come with me, so, I don't have a colleague, a peer who does what I do, which is crazy social media stuff, uh, here with me. So I'm increasingly spinning my wheels, waiting for the studio to be set up and all this stuff to happen. And it honestly is making me insane. And part of the reason that I'm insane, wait a minute, hold on here. What up Danny Marie 17, good morning. Danny Coach from, or Kosh from Facebook, welcome. I see my, my favorite Facebook supporters are all here on YouTube as well. Uh, thank you for joining us. Dear Eleanor says, ZPAC, first time I'll see you live. I love it. So I realized I'm starting to, you know, even though I'm, you know, doing the usual shat you're supposed to do, like meditating and all this, what I find all meditation is accomplished for me right now is to calm my mind enough for all this turmoil and emotion to come to the surface and then just be unleashed in the world on unsuspecting victims. So I, re, I started rereading Jonathan Haidt. He's a psychologist. I've talked about his elephant and rider metaphors, his book, The Righteous Mind, The Happiness Hypothesis. His most recent book is called The Coddling of the American Mind. And it's about how en masse, society seems to be suffering, especially young people, from the same cognitive thinking distortions that psychiatrists and psychologists have tried to train us to recognize and overcome using cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a, is, a, is a means of therapy that allow people to recognize when their thinking is distorted, and that cat has got a toy and is meowing for me to play with her. And my initial reaction is to want to throw the toy in the garbage because I'm irritated. Kitty, what? No, no. Um, so the idea that you recognize these cognitive distortions and then actually realize that, oh, they're not actually real, they're distortions that are affecting your thinking, your feeling, and your acting in the world. And if you actually keep a journal and you say, okay, what's happening here? How am I feeling? What's going on? You can realize these things are actually making us miserable. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm literally gonna throw this thing in the garbage. because I've been meaning to do this for a long time and I keep forgetting. Uh, for some reason, she dug one of the kids' toys out that we had thrown into the donation pile and became obsessed with this toy to the point where she'll bring it somewhere and just start screaming for like an hour. And uh, it's driving me crazy. And so speaking of crazy, we're going back to cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, that toy's gotta go, cause I can't take it. Um, she's still screaming. What is it, kitty? 
are we gonna have to have an intervention where we go through the CBT? So anyways, um, she wants a baby, says Catherine Eggleston. Well, she's been fixed, so maybe it's more she just wants to play with daddy. I guess I'm daddy. Kitty, I will play with you later. And yes, I'm talking to you like an adult, which is a cognitive distortion of anthropomorphizing an animal. Um, the, what Jonathan Haidt and his co-author Greg Lakoff, I think, uh, have determined is that a lot of what's going on on social media, the creation of this very anxious, depressed, neurotic generation, Generation Z, has really been relating to the idea that there's a collective cognitive distortion that you can see in individuals, but it also starts to happen on a bigger level. And so he was noticing when you know these things are happening on campus where people are demanding safe spaces and trigger warnings and all this stuff that there are these basic distortions of thinking, the way people fight with each other on Twitter. And looking through this again, looking at the different distortions, I realized I myself suffer from so many of these at any given time, and I bet you do too. And if we actually recognize what they are, we can actually stop in the middle of a crazy thought and actually, and that's what meditation ultimately is. It's about being mindful of the present moment and thoughts and feelings. Well, here's something you can actually do with it, okay? So let me go through some of these and you guys tell me, and Angela Davis, the author is Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, and his book is The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, some of these distortions, they're automatic thoughts that just arise because that's what the brain does. It secretes thoughts. And where suffering occurs is when we get carried away and identified with the thoughts and end up thinking, I am this thought, or I am upset, or I am depressed. Whereas in reality, it's just depression is arising. This thought is arising. What does it really mean, right? So, muted calicos can exhibit strange behavior, says Sarah Crane. This cat is strange in a wonderful way. Love this cat. But that thing she does with that object, notice now she stopped. The object is gone. I think that object triggers some OCD in the cat and she has to scream about it. So maybe it reduces her suffering to actually get rid of the object. Um, so, oh, by the way, Anon Kuntash, named after the Lamborghini, uh, says, I'm a psych major looking to go into medicine as a future physician. I hope to bring basic therapy to my par patients and properly educate them on the power of therapy. I think therapy is very powerful, uh, exceedingly so. So here are some of the distortions. Number one, mind reading. So mind reading says, hi Cynthia, mind reading says that um, you assume what someone or others will think without really knowing anything about their thoughts. So example, oh, he thinks I'm a loser. It's a kind of a thought projection. Like I, you're putting thoughts into people's minds. You're, you're assuming you know people's minds. People do this online all the time. Uh, he had bad intent, like this is what he meant to do. He's evil. He thinks this about people. Well, no, you can't say that. That's mind reading. It's a distortion that will lead you to suffering because you can ask a person what they're thinking and then they might tell you, honestly, or they might not, but you can't assume. And by making that assumption, you create a lot of distortion, not only in the world, but in your own thinking about that person and your relationship and yourself. And usually it's thoughts like, that person thinks I'm a ding dong, right? Which then leads you to behave in a way that actually proves you are a ding dong. Um, the next one is fortune telling. So you predict the future negatively. So things will get worse or there's danger ahead, like I'll fail the exam, I won't get the job. And again, you cannot predict the future, but that's the way the mind goes. The mind is designed to look at worst case scenarios. And it actually triggers tremendous suffering, thought distortion, and what is depression but rumination on the, these bad thoughts? And what's anxiety but future? In other words, worrying about these, these things happening in the future. And depression's a lot of regret about the past. So uh, you, Sadiq, says, sir, have you switched over to the YouTube? Uh, we are doing both Facebook and YouTube because I think both have their merits. Actually, YouTube is interesting because it's 50-50 male, female. Facebook is 80% female. So if we wanna reach the men, it might be a good place to be on the YouTube, if you know what I'm saying. Um, Callie says, Dr. Z-Dog, please discuss your thoughts about the most important ethical issues as related to CBT. I don't know what those are yet, Callie. If you can raise those, I might be able to um, address them directly. So catastrophizing is a big thought distortion. 
Catastrophizing is where you think that um, something that's happened is so awful and unbearable that you would never, it's just the end of the world. So, you know, it would be st the end of the world if I failed at this. Or if that person says no about, you know, my question, it's the end, it's the a disaster and depression and misery. Whereas in reality, you know, everything is transient, nothing is that important. Um, and you're really overblowing this, but that's what the mind does, especially when we're in a mood state where depression is more likely, anxiety is more likely, that kind of thing. Um, uh, it's, it's really important to recognize catastrophizing in particular because I do it a lot. You know, like, oh, you know, this video didn't do well or it didn't reach people and I really wanted it to. What's even the point? Nothing I do is worth doing. There's quite a few distortions in that. Uh, but one of them is catastrophizing, right? So, and by the way, this is my own therapy. So by going through these, I recognize them in myself, and I hope you do as well, recognize them in me, recognize them in you, and work to kind of say, you know what? Okay, I can actually recognize and therefore rethink and reframe these thoughts, which is part of CBT. I'm not a therapist. I don't know shit. I have Dunning-Kruger effect up the ass about this. I know a little bit, so I'm dangerous. I don't know what I don't know, but I do know that some of this stuff helps me, so I'm gonna talk about it. Um, labeling is another one. So assigning global negative traits to yourself and others. So I'm undesirable. He's a rotten person. These global traits, we all know they don't really exist. You're, you're labeling and you're reducing people, including yourself, to a label. That's never gonna be accurate. It's gonna color your perception and your behavior and it's not gonna be a good thing. Uh, <laughs> Rachel, Mar Rachel Mark Antonio, I recognize you, Ratch Mark. Uh, imposter syndrome, yes. I think many people suffer from that, me in particular. And that's a spectrum of Dunning-Kruger on the, I have too much knowledge and now, but I don't, in this case, I don't have too much knowledge. I'm just learning. So labeling is bad. Okay, that's a cognitive distortion. Discounting positives. So. You claim that the positive things you or others do are trivial. So, you know, if your wife says something nice to you, you think, well, that's what wives are supposed to do. They're supposed to be nice to you. Or if you get a bunch of positive messages, which I get all the time on Facebook, like, thank you for giving us a voice. Thank you for raising this issue. You know, you saved my job by doing this because the administration saw this. You did this. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's great. I guess we're doing something. Uh, and then I get a negative message that says, you know, you totally misrepresented this thing. You don't know what you're talking about. You're causing harm in the world and fuck you. And what happens? Discount all the positive and focus on the negative. And guess what? That is cognitive distortion number six, which is negative filtering. So negative filtering is you focus almost exclusively on the negatives and seldom notice the positives. Look at all the people who don't like me. That's a good quote, right? So, and I just gave you an example of focusing on negatives. Now, how much happier how much at peace, how much better in the world could we be if we had enough mindfulness through practice to recognize these thought distortions as they arise and accept them and go, that's what my mind is doing, but I don't need to act on that. I don't need to get caught in that. I don't need to identify that with that. I can see that from a detached perspective and act more rationally and compassionately towards myself and others. That's ultimately the goal. Let's look at another one. Overgeneralizing, you perceive a global pattern of negatives on the basis of a single incident. How many times do we do this? Overgeneralizing. So this generally happens to me. I seem to fail at a lot of things or I generally get all this hate mail. Whereas if you look at my mailbox, there'll be a thousand messages roughly a week. Three of them are negative. <laughs> but that's all I remember because of negative filtering, discounting positives and overgeneralizing. I must be causing a lot of hate because I'm getting bad messages. Dude, that's a distortion, right? Um, dichotomous thinking is another one. So you view events or people in an all or nothing's terms. I get rejected by everyone is an example of that kind of thinking or it was a complete waste of time or that person is terrible. Like th these are like black and white dichotomous thinking. You see it on Twitter all the time. If you say the wrong thing, you are now the completely bad person. The world is good and evil in conflict. That's a total fallacy. Everybody's doing their best, right? And dichotomous thinking is a terrible cognitive distortion that hurts a lot of us internally and externally. So um, let's see another good one here. I'm gonna pick the best ones here. 
Blaming is a good one. So you focus on the other person as the source of your negative feelings and you refuse to take responsibility for changing yourself. So she's to blame for the way I feel right now or my parents caused all my problems. How many of us do that? Guilty, guilty. Whereas you really look at it as, okay, I'm having these terrible feelings, but you're gonna externalize the blame on somebody else. Really it's because your mind secretes terrible feelings. It does that sometimes. If you can recognize what those feelings are, hey yo. If you can recognize what those feelings are, then you can actually act in a way that's more compassionate. You don't have to actually just react to it. Uh, another one is, let's see, unfair comparisons is a good one. You interpret events in terms of standards that are unrealistic. For example, you focus primarily on others who do better than you and find yourself inferior in the comparison. So quote, she's more successful than I am or others did better than I did on the test. I mean, how many of us do that? In healthcare, that is probably one of the most common things, particularly in school, you're always comparing yourself. And in fact, it's codified in our culture. Like, there's a curve, you're graded on it. The best students get the best training opportunities, whether it's ortho or derm or radiology, whatever it is. Uh, and you know, everybody else does family medicine. That's the culture, whereas what if we just did what we were passionate about, we're good at, and we focused on what we're good at, grew our own strengths, I bet you, you'd have a lot more people being amazing clinicians, especially primary care in every subspecialty, and a lot fewer people being miserable and having midlife crises. Uh, is that the plural of crises? I hope not. Uh, let's see here. Uh, emotional reasoning. This is one of my favorite cognitive distortions in cognitive behavioral therapy. Emotional reasoning, you let your feelings guide your interpretation of reality. So I feel depressed, therefore my marriage is a failure. So that's a good example. So you're allowing the coloration of your awareness at any given moment. So there's depression right now. It's a mood, it's transient, to basically influence everything in your life. Therefore I'm a failure at work. Therefore my kids hate me. Therefore this or that and the other thing. And, and this is yet another really, really powerful distortion that if we learn to recognize it, and then you look at it and you go, that's actually kind of silly. You can't blame yourself for it. It's your mind secreting these thoughts. It's what it does. It evolved to do that to keep us alive in an environment where you're competing with others. Well, now we're in an environment where we should be collaborating with others, where relations matter more than aggression, where uh, we can actually transcend into a world that is actually more productive, more peaceful, better for individuals and the collective by recognizing that our innate evolved drives can sometimes be harmful. And in this case, the mind evolved to be an asshole to us, to constantly force us to go out there and struggle and it worked back in the day, now it is more often than not maladaptive. Now sometimes you look at your thought patterns and they're actually, when you really look at them, you go, you know what, no, that's a valid feeling or perception or thought, in which case it's not a distortion and being able to recognize that takes practice too. And then you can act on that in a good way that doesn't harm others, but in a way that actually you know, uh, 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 is effective. Um, I think we've hit, you know, we've hit most, there's a few others that are a little more subtle. I think we've hit the biggest ones in cognitive behavioral therapy. And again, for people who are just joining, I'm talking about Jonathan Haidt's recent book, The Coddling of the American Mind. I'm gonna do a continuing medical education episode on that soon. This is just my thoughts on the appendix and his general discussion of cognitive behavioral therapy and how this was initially designed as an individual therapy, but now we're starting to see these distortions of thought on a broader, more public scale in social media, in public discourse, in media, and it's causing a lot of unhappiness, particularly in the younger generation that was raised in an overprotected, helicoptered way where they're kept safe from harmful words and harmful thoughts and as a result are very fragile, whereas really some degree of adversity is important and instead they're starting to display some of these cognitive distortions like dichotomous thinking, the world is just full of good and bad people. Uh, and you know, mind reading, I can tell what that person thinks by their tweet. Well, no, you don't know their intention. You don't know anything about them, right? Um, 
you know, blaming others, negative filtering, discounting positives, all of these overgeneralizing are now manifesting in people's social media behavior. Sarah Crane says, I coined the phrase, I am two days crazier than I was three days ago. <laughs> That's actually spot on. I, I think I'm actually just doing this podcast made me 30% less crazy. Uh, let me pull up, I'm gonna pull up your comments on, um, actually Victoria is here. Do you want to, I'm gonna hand her the comments and she can read them out because it's better that way. Hang on one second, library, my videos, cognitive behavioral therapy, let's try that. You wanna say hi to everyone? hey -o! So I'm sitting here on the stool in my kitchen and I'm making Victoria stand, why? Because I'm the boss and I get to do that. No, because she just walked in and we don't have another stool. Um, what are some good comments and questions, Victoria, from the audience on YouTube? Let's see, where was the last one you were at? Uh, I've been reading random ones. Feel free to poke through anywhere and okay, pick out let's something. let's see if anyone got missed. Uh, what's your did you do this one? What's your opinion on EDMR? I don't know what EDMR is. Is it pseudoscience or does it work? Talk therapy doesn't stop my brain from freezing when it gets shocked from potentially dangerous hazards or perceived dangers. So I think it's a kind of, I, I remember, again, because I'm not a psychologist, I don't know. So we would have to get a psychologist on to talk more about it, particularly as relating to PTSD and other struggles that people have. You don't wanna take advice from me on that just yet because I don't know. And a key thing is being able to say when you don't know because otherwise you're just gonna bullshit and you're gonna hurt people, especially on platforms like this, so I won't do that. Um, Kathy A said, who's Victoria? Victoria is the new member of ZDog Industries um, and kind of my right hand person who's helping me do pretty much everything in my life that I can't do myself, like tie my shoes um, and uh, help manage everything in the company. So uh, she's also being trained over the next couple weeks. So she's coming up to speed and is already teaching me all this shit about social media I didn't know. Um, what do we got? Rach Mark asks, imposter syndrome? Yeah, and actually, I, that one I did read, you and did. Uh, okay. yeah, so imposter syndrome Thank we talked about. Uh, try a something down further, yeah. Rachel Mark Antonio is one of our Facebook supporters. By the way, if you want to go into these deep dives a little bit more too, join us on the supporter tribe on Facebook. It's like four ninety nine a month. It's actually a pretty cool space and early videos and stuff like that. I might open that up on YouTube too, but I'm not sure yet. I think it's too 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 much to do at once. Oh, eye movement to sensitize and reprocessing. That's right, Dawn. Uh, this is for PTSD, correct? I've heard about this. I don't know enough about it to, con to, uh, to comment intelligently. So we'd have to get a good guest on the show for that, or I'd have to research it. Um, okay, how about this one from Callie? Did you read this one yet? Have you read? No. Okay, perfect. Callie asks, have you read Maun and... Dundurkel's 2010 paper about evidence-based practice and continuing professional development as related to clinical supervision. How much supervision do CBT providers have? Oh, this is interesting. So the question of the ethics around the supervision of CBT providers. So could CBT providers maybe be doing harm? I haven't read that paper. Um, of course, with therapists, it's very important that they're trained well and that there's ongoing, um, just like anything in healthcare, you need ongoing sort of validation of their skill set. I don't know what that is in psychology. And I imagine that harm can be done by a bad therapist, but in general, um, a good cognitive behavioral therapist or someone who employs that uh, can be life changing. And there are books that, uh, I'm actually just downloaded one that I wanna read, um, that even just reading the book has been clinically validated to reduce depression scores. And it's a CBD book. So this is a real thing, but it needs to be done correctly. Would two deaths in your life be a factor in PTSD and anxiety, close deaths, uh, non-ADEB 63? It really depends on the person. There has been a lot of looking into why some people bounce back from trauma and difficult events, in other words, are highly resilient, and others, uh, succumb to uh, PTSD and other 
uh, ailments because of the, the trauma. And there's a lot that's been written about this that we can talk about on another show. Jonathan Haidt wrote a bit about it in his book, The Happy Happiness Hypothesis. To some degree, people who are able to make sense out of trauma, sense making, people who are able to find meaning in uh, that, there's a piece of that that helps with other things, but there may just be also genetic components and other components in reinforcement that drive PTSD. So we'll talk about that another time. So Abigail asks, EMDR is good for PTSD, but also good for anxiety disorders and depression. I've heard that they think, believe, that is similar to how REM sleep benefits our brain in processing information. Yeah, so the eye motion uh, EMDR piece, again, I would have to learn more about it. You guys are teaching me about it. I think next time I will hopefully be able to teach you once I learn more about it. It's kind of fun too, learning about these things. You know, I wasn't that interested in psychology and those sort of aspects of it when I was in medical school as much. It was more the really deranged aspects of human psychology like severe schizophrenia, depression. That's what we learned on the wards on locked in patient sight wards. We barely learned about you know, the betterment of well people or people with mild disease, or people with you know, PTSD and things like that. We, we, in my training, I, I wasn't exposed to enough of that. Of course, I didn't go into psychiatry, so I didn't focus on that. Um, There's a question from Lauren Holm. Do you think this overprotection contributes to more serious conditions like bipolar? My husband was extremely sheltered both at home and at school, and he has been fighting the condition for a decade. Let me read that comment again, okay. yeah. So do you think overprotection can, can contributes to more serious conditions like bipolar? Okay, so this is the thing. This is very hard to tease out. When Jonathan Haidt talks about the coddling of the American mind, he's talking about young people, Gen Z in particular, being overparented, overprotected, a culture of safety, a bureaucracy of safety at institutions like colleges where you know we have trigger warnings and safe spaces and we have to make sure we get the pronouns right or else someone might be triggered and hurt and the idea that words can hurt people and cause physical harm is a safetyism kind of philosophy that Haidt argues is actually harming children who are anti-fragile. They benefit from some degree of adversity and resilience. Now your husband has bipolar is overprotecting um, something that triggered the bipolar, that's really hard to tease out. And honestly, it may be a chicken and egg thing. It may be that he exhibited signs of uh, some degree of mood disorder when he was younger, and that led to overparenting. So you just can't say. It's a bit, cause and effect is very hard. Correlation doesn't equal causality in all cases. So again, I, that's my thought on that. Haley Barber says, just tuning in, I'm a teacher and was wondering if you know of any CBT resources that have to do with incorporating CBT in the classroom setting high school? So incorporating CBT in the classroom setting high school, do I know of resources? I don't, but I think that is an amazing question. On some level, these ideas of teaching CBT to even young people would be so powerful, right? Because if children can recognize their thought distortions, it's hard because children are primarily emotional, right? The rational aspects of uh, their frontal lobe haven't yet clamped down. And that continues to evolve even into our 20s. So, you know, you'll, you'll see that, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was vastly more impulsive and uh, volatile than I am now. By the way, volatility, general emotional volatility, uh, neuroticism, extroversion, openness, conscientiousness, these are fundamental personality traits that are are a little bit malleable, but really are largely inborn. And this is something I'm increasingly believing. And you know, like when I take a personality test, my volatility scores are off the chart. My neuroticism scores on some elements are really high and on others are low. Like diligence, I'm quite low, but in terms of orderliness, I'm quite high. And so ideas about um, kind of uh, children you know, they may take their core personality traits and just amplify them because we haven't learned how to kind of manage and the, that, that, again, that frontal lobe that, that kind of puts the clamps on things hasn't evolved yet. Katie, or Kathy, I'm sorry, A asks ADHD. ADHD, so I'm assuming in general. Um, CBT. CBT for ADHD. So again, I don't know because ADHD is, a, is again a, a disorder of attention. 
it might make it more difficult for someone with ADHD to actually be able to focus on the arising of thoughts. For example, in meditation, ADHD initially can make meditation much harder because you're trying to focus on one thing, which is the breath, and be aware when you're losing track. But part of the problem with ADHD is, uh, or any ADD, uh, attentional deficit disorders, are you're not able to, attention doesn't, it, it, it's too scattered. But even with, with work, you can actually overcome that with ADD. It just takes more work. It is harder, but it takes more work. So the truth is, I think with CBT, you probably could stabilize enough that you could, CBT would be useful. There's no, I don't think there's any good reason that it isn't. Now, again, I'm not a psychologist, and I'm the victim of Dunning-Kruger effect here, so I may be saying shit that I know nothing about, but I'm just speculating from first principles, and I hope you understand that that's what I'm doing because uh, otherwise, you know, uh, I'm being disingenuous about this because I'm an amateur. Uh, what do you think? Where are we at? Um, Squall549 says, do you think the advent and the rise of social media, media has contributed to the apparent rise in mental health issues among young adults, children over the past 10 to 15 years? So uh, the rise of social media, yes. And so it... In the book, Calling of the American Mind, he squarely blames social media, and I've done rants on this, uh, for uh, a rise in mental illness in children, partially because of several aspects. There's less actual physical risk-taking, so people are drinking less, having sex later, um, driving later, like all these other things are happening that in the old days were considered risk-taking dangerous behaviors. Now that's been replaced with sitting in bed with a phone connected to social media, which means you can be bullied anywhere you are, not just at school, you can now be bullied at home. And it's a never escape. It turns out girls in particular are more affected by this because at that age in particular, they are perpetrators of relational aggression. They harm others through reputation damage, through uh, this sort of course of verbal bullying through emotional manipulation, whereas boys are still more physically aggressive. They bully people through pushing people. It's not always true, but it's as a stereotype, it tends to fit a lot of the time. So what we're seeing increasingly in girls relative to boys, still increasing in boys, is depression, anxiety, suicidality, and actual suicide attempts. Uh, rising. This is probably the most neurotic anxious and depressed generation that we have yet raised. Why? Because we're in a transitional period where we haven't figured out how social media affects human brains that are wired over millions of years to be social relational creatures and we have put basically a weapon of mass destruction in a little girl's hand where she has now access to everything and I see it in my own children. I don't let them have social media. My oldest has a phone and even now I'm like getting nervous about what's going on because she's in middle school but she doesn't have social media. And honestly, uh, I am an advocate of not giving children access to their own social media accounts until they're 18 and their frontal lobe is formed and they're able, and, and helping them and getting them through and understanding what is real, what isn't. The cognitive distortions that happen online, can you imagine if someone's bullying you online? That's not even a real fucking thing. And yet here they are, right? And they're affecting you in your own thought process, your own self-esteem, your own self-worth, your fear of missing out. They're at a party, you're not. Okay, now I'm a bad person. Now comes the overgeneralization. Everything I do is bad. Now comes the mind reading. They all hate me. Now comes the negative filtering. I remember all the bullying comments and none of the positive things that friends and family and loved ones have said about me. Okay, now comes the dichotomous thinking. Everybody's terrible and they hate me because they said this and this. I mean, all the distortions that we talked about play out in social media on a scale and on a theater that is unparalleled in the history of human evolution. And we've given this to our children and now our children are trying to kill themselves. And people who deny this fact are delusional. <laughs> They're just ignoring this. Facebook. I mean, part of the reason I'm here on YouTube is that I'm starting to see this in Facebook. I'm starting to say, am I being hypocritical telling fans to come to Facebook and watch me when I'm telling them in the same, out of the other side of my mouth, Facebook is damaging our children, it's damaging adults, it's associated with more depression, fear of missing out, uh, uh, all these other things. You know, I have to ask these questions of myself. Uh, so that was a pretty good question. Colton Papa says, do you see mental health being integrated into primary care in the near future? Also, are you familiar with 
Nims Ardoc. I don't know what Nims Ardoc is. Uh, let me see the question. Right here. Um, mental health being integrated with primary care in the near future. Okay. Oh, the National Institute on Mental Health. Um, I don't know what RDOC is, but I do know that integration with primary care of mental and behavioral health uh, stuff is crucial. It was crucial in our clinic, Turntable Health. We had Nina Perales, who was our licensed clinical social worker. She was a therapist. She was a mindfulness teacher. She was a yoga teacher. She was the perfect package. She now works for Caremore. And she taught us that we all, what we already knew, which is, probably greater than 50% of what we see in primary care is driven by behavioral health. It's depression, anxiety, substance abuse, social stuff. It's not physical, but it becomes physical. And so integrating behavioral health in primary care is, and I keep forgetting to talk about this because there's so much that's wrong with healthcare. This is a central piece of what's wrong and it's a central piece of what you can fix. You can fix it. Um, it's a solvable problem. Embed behavioral health in primary care. Pay for the total package. Pay to keep people healthy. Integrate it into the rest of the care continuum. Everything from EMS to SNF to hospital. Put everybody's skin in the game. Hold patients accountable by putting a little bit of skin in their game. It, this is a solvable thing, people. Like, we should be optimistic. Why are we so miserable? You know why? because of the thought distortion of negative filtering, the thought distortion of catastrophizing. The system's so broken, I can't fix it. Uh, I, all I see is the negative stuff. I don't see the fact that there are bright spots emerging. You know what? Fuck it. The goal of my show from now on, as much as I can remember to be mindful to do it, is to point out where things are working, to point out the positives, to focus on the relationships and the connections that are going to actually transform everything. And, and until we as a collective start to see that and speak as a we instead of an I and me, as an us and we, nothing is going to change. This is where we've evolved to now as human beings. We have to accept it, embrace it, and optimize it, and I think we can do it. By the way, what I just said, accept, embrace, and optimize, sounds stupid as fuck. I take it all back. Uh, where are we at? Vernon asks, hi doc, are you familiar with Charles Bryson and Vlad Mozek's work on depression and other mood disorders as primitive immune responses to impending microbial threats. So this idea of is, is mental illness a response to I immune dysfunction from impending microbial threats. I haven't read this research. It sounds a little far out to me, to be fully honest. Um, I, correlation doesn't equal causation. Nobody knows. I actually think mental illness is more complex than something reducible to something like that. I think it's also more complex than a chemical imbalance in the brain. You guys know what I think of chemicals. I think they're just icons in our interface that how we see reality. In reality, it's all relational. It's all, um, uh, that's why talk therapy works because we're relational entities, right? Um, stool transplant, says Katie Hodak. Cures everything, Katie. We all know that. Um, Mm -hmm. Callie says, thoughts about marketing healthcare to the social media users by feeding into it via telehealth, text, etc. I wonder. Thoughts about marketing social media, marketing healthcare, healthcare to social media users. So obviously social media is a big marketing platform. We use it as a marketing platform for select companies that we choose to work with that are aligned with our vision of Health 3.0. So we'll do a show with a teletext primary care company that offloads visits from the ER by allowing you to text your doctor any hour of the day uh, a picture of your rash and having them look at it, having access, have, being able to write you prescriptions, that kind of thing. I think these levels of disruption using technology are valid. Replacing a human relationship is not. Over-marketing of this stuff is absolutely rampant, especially telehealth, which mostly is a scam, but when it does work, works well. The other one we did was um, the virtual bedside presence, which I think can help offload stress in hospitals and be effective at keeping both caregivers and patients safe. You can disagree, and that's what the comments are for, but those are the things we kind of highlight on social media. Um, oh, here's a good one. Abigail Randall, do you know if ACE, adverse childhood, adverse childhood experiences, tests are being regularly utilized in pediatrician offices, especially with research showing high ACEs have a strong correlation to health? So. 
In some offices, yes, and I had my good friend, Dr. Harry, who's a pediatrician on the show, talking about ACEs. He and other folks at Kaiser in particular, because there were Kaiser studies on this, adverse childhood experiences, like real trauma in children, um, have been correlated downstream with chronic disease, depression, obesity, and other uh, adult dysfunction. And Again, how much of it is causation? How much is correlation? Boy, intuitively, it sure seems correct because you can influence the wiring of the brain, the wiring of the body through stress and external you know, relational things. So should we be screening for it? I think yes. The question is what can we do about it? Well, then we can recognize what's going on, help with therapy and other things like that that address the underlying causes. How many people with fibromyalgia do you know who were sexually or physically abused or a victim of some kind of trauma? A lot. So that says something about the connection between mind, body, and experience. I think it's one continuum. Ryan Kelly says, aside from there being just a few epigenic resources to integrate into treatment, do you know of any biomarkers that clinicians use as a diagnostic tool? So apart from epigenetic uh, markers, do we know of any biomarkers that clinicians use as a, as a resource? Not, not broadly. So there are you know, these markers, these different um, ways to measure compounds that will say, oh, this is correlated with X, especially with mental illness. Not very robust yet. Hopefully the science improves outside of research spaces and becomes clinically relevant because then it just gives us another tool. The question is we don't want to be too reductionist about this stuff. Reducing everything to molecules and those kind of things is, is just generally a recipe for uh, uh, delusion. Um, so we have to be careful about that. Um, this one is just a little off topic, but it says, Hitchhiker, do you see... Did you see another Dr. Medlife Crisis video about you? Medlife Crisis? Is that the doctor? See another Dr. Medlife Crisis video about you? No, I didn't. I don't know what the, I don't know what that is, but uh, it's intriguing. Now I'm fascinated. Um, let's see here. So Marissa at the bottom said that, wow, I have had traumatic events and have fibromyalgia and RA. Right. And Marissa K, I saw your comment. I think, um, you would be hard pressed. Look, at, look even at Lady Gaga, right? I did a show on watching her documentary, Five Foot Two, and she has chronic pain, effectively what sounds like fib fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, whatever it is. Then you ask her what happened. Well, you know, she was raped, sexually abused, all this terrible stuff happened. And what I think we have to do is, first of all, we have to open up with compassion to people who've had these terrible things happen and understand that they do affect the physical well-being as well as the emotional well-being of people, especially as they grow up. And um, when you actually see the kind of things that have happened to people, it's very hard to recover without help, without therapy. Now, what we end up doing in our wonderful uh, one drug fits all to fix everything with a drug culture is, oh, well, we'll just throw narcotics at it or benzos at it or whatever. And that is not uh, an answer in itself. It's just not. And it's very frustrating when I see these poor patients who have this terrible chronic pain and they're on high, high, high dose narcotics and they're like, I need this. It's like, I bet you there's other stuff going on. And if we had the tools and the resources and the autonomy to care for you the way you deserve to be cared for, you wouldn't be on such high doses of Oxycontin, right? And then when the prescription runs out, going into withdrawal and suffering and being sick and having to go to the ER and suffer all this indignity, you know, that could be prevented. Um, yeah. See any others? Um, let's see. Diva Knit says, any comments on the connection between depression, anxiety, and being homozygous? Homozygous, yeah. Homozygous for an MTHFR defect. Okay, so MTHFR is this metrotidro, metro, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. It's, um, I did a show on this as relating to vaccines because people who are MTHFR mutants on whatever level, uh, some of them believe that they can't be vaccinated, which is bullshit. So associations between MTHFR and other stuff are rampant. Does it mean there's any causation? 
Does it mean that you have to do anything differently? Okay, apart from folate supplementation, especially in women who've had miscarriages or clots, um, the answer is no. We don't really see uh, the evidence for this. And honestly, I did uh, extensive genetic testing as part of a show we were doing and found out I'm like you know, homozygous for some MTHFR mutation. And I don't care. Like my folate levels are normal. I don't do anything differently. I've been fully vaccinated. I don't think I have any diagnosable mental illness. I just have the usual mood swings, high volatility personality traits and general insanity of being me. Um, Dam says, uh, uh, Nanadeb, I have a friend who needs guidance, obese, diabetic, heavy smoker, eats totally wrong, fibromyalgia. So Nanadeb, or Nandeb, ask this question, not so much what's wrong with you to this person, but what happened to you. So let me repeat that. You don't ask what's wrong with you. My gosh, you're obese, you have fibromyalgia, a million problems. You ask what happened to you, because more often than not, something happened in childhood or later that is now manifesting. And until we get to the root of that, you know, like you make fun of psychiatrists all you want, like, oh, what happened in your childhood? It matters. It actually matters physically uh, as an adult. Um, and Nana Deb says, yeah, she had a tough life. Exactly, right? Now, again, that doesn't absolve you from making your life better. It doesn't mean you don't take accountability and control of your life. It doesn't mean you don't have tools and you seek out relationships that are healthier. It doesn't mean you give up. No, the opposite. It means now you're empowered to go, oh, I can overcome this. This doesn't define me. I'm going to do better. And that means you need help, right? Thanks for the 199, Rebecca Hartman, and everyone else who did the little super chat thing. From Fisting Gorilla. Forgive the username, former farmer tech here. I've been feeling used up, burnt out from my three year experience at high volume wags farm. How do you pick yourself up after burnout has occurred? Can you show me that comment? Right here. Fisting Gorilla, I actually like your username. I think it's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, farm tech, yeah, high, high volume wags farms. So, Walgreens, I think, is what he means by wags. Um, how do you pick yourself up after burnout has occurred? Former farm tech here. Okay, there's no one answer for everybody. Like, I was very burned out in my career uh, as a hospitalist, very burned out. How did I pick myself up? I recognized the burnout. I realized the distortions in my thinking it was creating, that I was a bad person, that I had poor accomplishment, I was emotionally detached, all the signs of burnout. Once I recognized that, I said, well, what's in my control and what's not in my control? Is it in my control to reframe my experience at work? Yes, a little bit. Is it in my control to find a different path? It is. I chose to find a different path. So for me, it was getting up and saying, okay, no, 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 this is not about me. This is about things that are bigger than me. But my response, my own personal resilience to this is in my control. And it may mean walking away. It may mean reframing what I do and looking at the positive aspects of what I do and stop focusing on the cognitive distortions within my job, but within limits. I realized fundamentally what I was doing in healthcare is what I still feel, which is most of what we do is harmful, most of what we do is unnecessary, most of what we do is incentivized by a payment model that is broken, most of what we do hurts patients, the stuff that we do do that helps patients isn't rewarded, sitting with them, spending time with them, focusing on what matters. We don't support our colleagues well, we don't keep our providers safe, we don't uh, pay people for doing the right thing. People don't do well financially by doing good for patients, they do well financially by doing stuff to patients. All this stuff over time was a drip, 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 drip of moral injury that caused me to say enough, but it took me too long. And you can blame yourself for that or you can say, no, nope, that's how the human mind works. As Upton Sinclair said, and I've quoted him before, it is impossible to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. So just even understanding that might get people to suddenly realize and wake up. All right, I don't know. I think, do we have any other good comments or should we stop? Uh, maybe this last one. Yeah, yeah. Perry Millet says, do you think we have inborn personality traits? Do you think we have inborn personality traits? I don't think we have inborn personality traits. I know we do. And I'll tell you why. And Again, Hyde and others have talked about this. I'll tell you a, a, an experimental answer and an anecdotal answer. Experimentally, you can take twins who are identical, have the same genetics, raise them independently, like different adopted parents say. 
bring them back after years and do personality tests. And they have like something like, I forget what the concordance is, it's like 90% concordance on these big five personality traits, like openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. What does that tell you? Different parents. It tells you that most of this is genetic. I am a firm believer that the majority of our personality traits are inborn. That doesn't mean they can't be influenced, ameliorated, modulated, even transformed by experience. It just means for most of us, we're given a hand and then we determine in life how we play that hand. So anecdotally, I'll tell you, when my first child was born, we looked at her and we were like, oh, this is who this child is, probably gonna change. Didn't change a bit. She was who she is now the second she came out. And I knew it because the second one came out and I was like, this is a different child. Knew it immediately, not by appearance, by behavior. This is a different personality. I can tell you this. And that held up over time. There's something about the wiring of our brain as it unfolds during embryogenesis, some of it's genetic, some of it's development, that is entirely starts to put us on a momentum path towards what our personalities are. I really think so. Doesn't mean we can't change things, doesn't mean we can't be transformed, doesn't mean we can't awaken. There's a lot of things that can change, but we are given a hand and we decide what to do with it. That's what I think. And you can fight me if you think I'm wrong. <laughs> I think we did this. I think we did a thing here. Um, let me know, do me a favor, uh, tell everyone you can to subscribe to us on YouTube and when they do, they click a little bell next to the subscribe button that determines turning on notifications. If those notifications aren't set right, you won't get emails or notifications when I'm live. You won't get notifications when we put out a new video and that's kind of lame. I'd love you guys, Kitty's back. Uh, I'd love you guys to um, be able to, to be a part of the conversation, which means you gotta be notified. Um, and see, like Lauren says, even with the bell, I don't get notifications. Sometimes, Lauren, you actually gotta go into the app and your notifications on your phone and make sure YouTube notifications are turned on. It's, it's very complicated, but in general, you'll get halfway there by hitting that bell icon. Um, Mitch is here. Can, can you grab the cat for me and just hand her off to me? Thanks. There we go. Ah, there's Mitch. Mitch, you really got on my nerves earlier with that little toy, didn't you? But now everybody's looking at you and they wanna say hi. I threw away her worm toy because she was going crazy again. She was like, wow, wow, in the middle of the talk. I was like, you know what? I think this toy is causing more harm than good. It's making the cat crazy. Um, Hot Fire says, you got a nice kitchen, man. So my wife, in conjunction with our remodeling people, designed this kitchen because we had owned this house and then um, never we rented it out and never sold it. So we were never priced out of coming back to the Bay Area. And we saved some money in Las Vegas being in a low cost area and then put that into our house here. So, you know, now we're broke again. Somebody's asking, um, are you on Instagram? We are definitely on Instagram. Uh, we are the meme factory on Instagram. 267,000 followers, I think, on Instagram. Definitely come follow us there if you're into crazy memes, because that's pretty much what we do on Instagram and cool Insta stories. Um, all right, I love you guys. We will talk again later. Thanks to Victoria for answering, for reading these comments. Thanks to you for being awesome. We out.